I like to watch people. Sometimes I ride the subway all day and look at them and listen to them. This is Burn While Reading. <laughs> Welcome to the very first, dare I say, the inaugural episode of Burn While Reading, a literary podcast. I'm Ari, the robot dog. And I'm Jen, 17 and crazy. And in case you haven't guessed what we're covering today, today we are going to be talking about Ray Bradbury's famous dystopian sci- oh, I can't, I can't say sci-fi. He never liked it being called sci-fi. Air quote it. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> fantasy novel, Fahrenheit 451. So I want you to, I'm going to take you back a little bit for a second. Where were you in 2010? Because I was in high school. I was in the 10th grade, and I had the prettiest English teacher in the whole wide world, and he wanted Fahrenheit 451 to be the very first book that we read in his class. And so I have a little bit of experience reading this novel before, but there's not a lot that I remembered over the past seven years. What about you, Jen? This was my first read through of Fahrenheit 451. Seriously, they never like no nope. what no summer nope. reading lists no like nope. you didn't have to read it in class ever never. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> that's, I I'm super jealous honestly. Like, I mean, well we're get we're gonna get to. I was gonna say it's not a bad novel, but we're gonna get. To that. <laughs> but I am kind of jealous that like they weren't kind of looming over you saying read this book or else. I didn't even have to read Animal Farm. But we're going to get to that another time, too. I love Animal Farm, but we're going to talk about that in a later episode. So what you, what you sipping out of there? Smells smells good. Um, It is Lapsung Sochung, okay. which I think I pronounced correctly. Not quite more, sure more or that. less. <laughs> smells good. Smells like a campfire. Very appropriate. Yep. I dig it. So, so we're not jumping right into the book first. We're going to jump into the when and the where of the book. Mr. Ray Bradbury grew up in, in Los Angeles for most of his life. He was born in 1920, and he graduated high school in 1938, but apparently he never went to college. Just goes to show you, you don't have to go to college you don't to be have successful. To, you, you don't have to go to college, but something about Fahrenheit 451, you just kind of like assumed the entire time, oh, this guy must be. He must have gone to college. Yeah, yeah, but no, he never he never went to college, and actually, like I I didn't write this down in the bio because I didn't think it was important, but it's a kind of an interesting little tidbit. Apparently, the first couple of years out of high school, he made a living selling newspapers, and he just he just knew he knew for most of his life that he wanted to be a novelist, and so he wrote Fahrenheit 451 in 1953, which explains a lot. Yeah. Explains an awful lot. So uh, much. <laughs> It was his fifth uh, written work after The Martian Chronicles. But we're going to get a little bit more into, like, stuff he said about his own book later on, because that is super relevant to me yep. in the burn department. And we're just going to get into the novel right now. Yeah. Okay. The first part of the novel is entitled The Hearth and the Salamander. Yeah, I feel like it's really split almost into a three-act play. It really is. And... But, okay, so so here's the thing that you open this book and it's like a dick jumps out and just smacks you across <laughs> the face. You get hit with this ridiculous amount of sexual imagery the second you, you start reading it. Yeah. Like, I know, like, this is your first time reading yeah. it. Like, did, did it kind of feel that way for you? Yes. He's holding a gigantic hose that's spitting its venom all over these books and his, his face is all red and he's super hyped up and he's just enjoying himself way too. He goes back to the fire department later on and he like, he like catches a glance of himself in the mirror and he's like, he winks at himself and he's it, whistling as he leaves work. It is laden with sexual imagery. This guy, this guy got laid. Basically, by a he by feels a, like he just got by a me. giant flamethrower. <laughs> also, I should bring this up now that the guy's name is Guy Montag, and I seven years ago I had no idea who Guy Fieri was, but I gotta say the second I heard it, like like fire imagery plus a guy named Guy, 
<laughs> you can't help but imagine frosted tips, right? Frosted tips yep. and sunglasses glued to the back of the guy's head. We're going to Flava Town. <laughs> oh, God. No, please, no. <laughs> So so he he's leaving work and he runs into I do not exaggerate this girl enters like an anime character yes like a manic pixie dream girl he turns the corner she is the quintessential manic pixie dream girl she's probably the very first manic pixie she's the OG I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like expound upon that until we read Lolita because I don't know but <laughs> um, she might be the OG I don't know I never read Lolita but. He turns the corner and there's this whip of of wind and autumn leaves like swirling around her and her hair is flying back in the wind and Isn't just... she blonde too or did he not No no I think she I think she is blonde actually. Okay, yeah. because for some reason I have this picture of almost like Luna Lovegood standing there. Oh yeah, well she I mean she has the personality to match with that too. So this is <laughs> No, no, Luna's ten times better than her. That's, yeah, that's offensive to Luna Lovegood. <laughs> but this is the first time that we meet Clarice, Clarissa? Clarice? Clarice? I'm not good with that name. I've seen it written before, and I, I don't, I never know if it's... I think it's just Clarice. Clarice? Okay, so this, we meet, we meet Clarice McLennan, and she introduces herself the same way that you introduced yourself to this podcast. Seventeen and crazy. That... That's like every teenage girl that you've ever met. It's, I'm not like other girls. I'm a little crazy. Well, like how? You know, just, just crazy. crazy. Oh, my God. And they start up this conversation. I forget exactly what spurs it. I think he's just asking her why she's out so yeah, late. It's because like, it's, I get the sense that it's like 2 in the morning. Oh, yeah, it's like the middle of the night. And she's just this 17-year-old girl walking around the streets before, which... I mean, we're going to talk about this later, is definitely not safe in this scenario. You should not be out. Even, like, it's 2017 and we tell people they shouldn't be out that late by themselves. But in this world, you definitely don't want to be out. You don't go out late. You do not go out late. You're going to get, I don't know You will die. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or get put on a government watch list. (laughs) And she she talks about like like she really jumps around from subject to subject, but the same it was vein, so hard to read. The vein of the conversation is essentially, you know, I heard that a long time ago things weren't like the way they are now. Like billboards used to actually be really small on the highways instead of stretching for miles and miles. And firefighters stopped put, fires. Right, they put out fires, not started Burning them. them. I'm realizing now that we didn't mention that Mr. Guy Fieri Montag is a a fireman, quote unquote. So his whole deal is he he burns books for a living. That's his thing. And so she's like, well, I heard a long time ago, cause cause my uncle who's been in prison twice, like that's that's an important part of the yeah. conversation. My uncle who was in prison twice told me that a long time ago firemen put out fires instead of starting them. So her entire family's already on the watch list. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're they're most wanted trouble trouble troublemakers. And she talks about stuff like my uncle tells me, you know, you should notice things in nature like the dew on the grass and the man in the moon and yeah, my uncle's been in prison twice. Did I tell you that already? <laughs> He's been in prison twice. And then it's she's, like she's got a little bit of hero worship for her uncle for just being so <laughs> incarcerated. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where I was like, going with that. And she basically ends the conversation before he gets a chance to say anything. It's like, are you happy with your life? And then she, she, she's she just runs. <laughs> she's bails. So it turns out he's not happy with his life at all. So not happy. Uh, he, we, this is the first time also that we hear about this deep dark secret that he has we don't know what it is yet but he's got a deep dark secret yeah but he gets home and shit hits the fan so fast he gets home and he assumes that his wife is just asleep it turns out she's tried to commit suicide by taking or potentially got so enveloped in this dream world that she didn't realize. That she had taken an entire bottle of sleeping pills. I, I'm just going with the book perspective. Devil's advocate. That's, that's true. We don't know that she tried to commit suicide. It could just be that she didn't realize exactly how many sleep pills she was taking. Yeah. That's a potential. But either way, 
she is dying in their bed. Yeah. And Guy calls up these guys. He assumes they're doctors to come and resuscitate her. And they're like plumbers. They come with this machine and they hook her up to these hoses and they pump the sleeping pills out of her body. And then they they're like, yeah, that'll be, tw- that'll be 20 bucks. Like, this is the first time we really see, like, exactly how impersonal the world that he lives in is. Yeah. You sh- you thought shit was weird because he was burning books? No, it gets even worse. And she wakes up in the morning and she has no idea. She has no recollection of anything. He's like, you know, you, you tried to commit, well, I don't know if he actually said, like, you tried to commit suicide, but he's like, you took a whole bunch of sleeping pills and almost died last night. And she's, and she's like, like, no, I didn't. I just got, I just got really turned at a party, like, what are you talking about, Kyle? You're so silly. Buy me another TV. Buy me another wall TV so I can have an enclosed parlor so I can be in the middle of everything. They are literally talking about the fourth wall here. She wants to <laughs> close the fourth wall. That's there is not, no breaking of the fourth wall. You can't do that. And we also find out that apparently people would, like, try to kill themselves on a regular basis oh, yeah. in this town. Like, it's, like they're like, yeah, this is, like, the, the fourth or fifth uh, we've call got a, gun. We've something. got another one in, like, five minutes. We need to get there. Impersonal, and she's like, wait, you okay, guys aren't doctors? And it's like, no. They saved the doctors for the real emergencies. That's why they created this machine. Yep. Yeah. So, like, they don't even need to, like... They, just, they don't even need to send doctors anymore. They just send... They literally just hook you up, and it filters your blood clean. Hook you up, pay me, leave. Done. Done so, in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so so Guy leaves Mildred all alone. He, he leaves, and he decides to go for a walk, and he runs into Clarice again. And, of course, they talk about, like, nature, and she's picking dandelions, and she's like... Oh, if you have yellow on your chin, when I put this under your chin, it means you're in love. Oh, there's no yellow. You must not love anyone. Not even your wife, who you've lived with for we don't even know how long right now. Basically, like ten what years. I got out of this is Clarice is a little shit. Oh, yeah, she's definitely a little shit. But <laughs> and she, she knows so. full well what she is doing. And she doesn't care. We also find out about Clarice that, um... They've been sending her to see a psychiatrist because they treat her like she's antisocial at school. Meaning she doesn't like to talk about all the dumb shit that the kids are talking about at her school right now. Like the TV and the fun parks where you get to go and blow shit up and driving and and stuff like that. No, she always wants to talk about like, oh, did you did you see how pretty the rain looked on the sidewalk today? And she's, I mean, like, if anything, like, maybe maybe send this girl to someone for, like, a little bit of ADHD therapy, but other than that, like... They don't care about ADHD in this world. That's good. They care about the fact that she doesn't care about the things that other kids care about, and therefore she's a threat. She's she's wrong. She's a threat. She is mentally ill. Enter the robot dog. Now, alright, I need to... I really need to nitpick on this. If you're going to say that something is a robot dog, I would assume that you would want it to look like a robot dog, not kind of dog-like almost. My imagery when I read this passage, I imagined a fucking metal water bear. That's what I thought of. Like, a combination of, like, you've seen those, like, robotic, like, like, weird kind of like four-legged type robotics projects that have like this like it kind of looks like it could be a dog it's got the legs going like like bent inward and like you can you can kick him and it'll try to right itself i imagined a combination of that and a fucking water bear eight legs exposed machinery it's got a quote-unquote snout but it doesn't like it's got like what, it's got, like, yellow lamps on its head to kind of, like, in place of yeah. eyes. And it's got a fucking snout. And the snout is, like, it, it extends, and there's a needle inside of it. And the needle is supposed to inject paralytics into whatever the robot dog is attacking. The robot dog is actually called the mechanical hound, and it's a tool that they're using at the fire station. To track for, down yeah, they they don't they, they don't really necessarily say like what it's for right I now, see. but it becomes important later on. 
So so this awful insectoid fucking monstrosity does not like guy one day. Can we just call it spider dog? Sp- you know what? Yeah, let's fucking <laughs> call it spider dog. This thing does not like Guy one bit. He tries to approach it one day when he's at the fire station, and it, like, it doesn't really attack him, but it kind of, like, uh, it starts to get really, like, uppity. Hyped it, up, almost. Yeah. Like, it, like, I pictured almost, like, you know how a dog's back will start to, like, the fur will rise? Yeah, like, I imagine, you like, can you can t- see the mechanics in its shoulders Starting back to tense. Looking. Right, right, right. He's convinced, like, he's, this is the first sign of Guy's paranoia. <laughs> You can and damn is he's, he paranoid. He's fucking he's sure that this dog has something out for him. When he's never done anything wrong as in in his entire life. <laughs> theoretically speaking. From what we know, he has never done anything wrong. And he's like, this dog is gonna try and kill me. Except that we do hear about his deep dark secret. And this time we know that the deep dark secret <laughs> Is inside his air conditioning vent back at home. He's losing it. He's hiding something. I mean, I, you can you can only assume what it is at this point. Like if he keeps fucking mentioning it in the world that he lives in, like you can only assume what's inside his AC vent. At yeah, home. but still. So we learn some more about Clarice. Uh, this is like the whole like yeah she's antisocial at school and oh yeah do you know what do you know what dead leaves smell like I I question whether Ray Bradbury's nose worked or not, actually, <laughs> because he keeps on saying, like, certain things smell like certain things that they don't actually smell like. Dude, dead leaves do not smell like cinnamon. They smell like dirt. <laughs> nice try, Ray. But they do. They smell like dirt. Maybe they don't in smell this like spices. world. In this magical, futuristic world where, you know, you have TVs and people mail you lines so you can interact with the screen. Okay, no, we're going to backtrack a little bit because I want to rail on that so hard. <laughs> Look, all right, I am a theater kid. Jen, we've been in theater We have been in plays together. We've been in productions together at school. Let me fucking tell you. It doesn't work that way. You do not have the luxury of getting out of tech week. Because someone sent you the lines while you were comfy at home and said, oh, just read these over for 20 minutes and we'll start the production when we're done reading it. You can't just cold read it and expect it to like, I I mean, I know it was the whole like, oh yeah, I have these lines so that I can pretend that I'm socializing with these people who aren't actually here. They pre-wrote the conversation. They pre-wrote the fucking conversation. But that is an insult to theater children everywhere. That is an insult to any type of theater. But especially theater kids. (laughs) Because we're theater kids. I mean, I'm sure that, like, if you're on Broadway and you actually have, like, assistants and people to do your makeup for you, that, like, I mean, I I, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I feel bad. I feel like I'm insulting several people who I, I admire very highly, so I'm just going to stop. <laughs> we both call bullshit on the fact that she just got these lines in what I'm assuming is her email because I doubt they get snail mail. Well, I don't know. See, it kind of I kind of got the vibe that like, yeah, they just mailed her a giant envelope filled with lines. Fine. She gets this package and all of a sudden while she's cooking breakfast, she can be in this production. That's not how it works. Mm-mm. So, so we learn a little bit more about Clarice, and we go back and forth between the fire station where guys kind of, like, we're, we're just kind of, like, getting introduced to, like, other characters yeah. around him. We're it's going exposition back and forth between, time. Between Clarice and the fire station, and then suddenly a week goes by, and Clarice is fucking gone. No Clarice. No family. No Did- incarcerated uncle. No nothing. Her house is just empty, and she's they gone. Are, they're all gone. They left in the middle of the night, I believe. I, like, they left yeah, and no like, one saw I mean, them leave. I mean, he gets out one day, and they're just, like, gone. And so he goes to the fire station, and he's talking to his captain, and he just kind of, like, casually brings up this one assignment that they had. And he finds out that the guy who owned the house and owned these illegal books got taken away to an asylum. No reason. But he owned books, so therefore he must be insane. Mm-hmm. And we, we get to learn, like, a lot more uh, via, uh, is it Captain Beatty or Commander Beatty? I think it's Captain Beatty. I, th- I, I had Captain I'm probably, in my I head for some B- reason. Beatty. Why am I saying it? It's probably, like, Beatty. 
Captain B. Captain B. Captain B. All right, Captain B. <laughs> we learn a lot from Captain B. Like, apparently the government has completely rewritten history to make it seem like firemen have always been burning books. Because Guy brings up this whole, like, oh, yeah, this girl on my street told me that a long time ago firemen used to put out fires. And is and Captain B is like, what are you talking about? We learn from the fireman's manual that, I don't know how many hundreds of years ago, because this is supposed to happen in the future, Benjamin Franklin was the very first guy in the world to burn books. When Benjamin Franklin was the first guy to open the fucking public library. How do those things get twisted up? Like, it's not... There's not this, like, insane game of telephone that's starting with Benjamin Franklin opened the first public library and ending with Benjamin Franklin used to burn books. And also, can I just talk about the logical fallacies that happen with everyone in this world where somehow, even though books were published, they were illegal. Look at that logical fallacy right there and tell me how anyone ever believed it. But I suppose what Bradbury was going for, and mm -hmm. I'm just assuming this, was that these people are like sheep. Basically. And we can say nothing for the creativity of this dystopian government. They're pretty fucking creative with, like, oh yeah, Benjamin Franklin used to burn books. The government is pretty damn creative. And I'm sure the people who do all the TV and everything are pretty creative. Mm-hmm. But the regular people, everyday people, like you, me... Guy Fieri. Guy Fieri. <laughs> they're fucking idiots. Essentially, that's what we're working with right now. Everyone in a position of power probably has a little bit of sense to them. But if you're just a person, you're, you're stuck in the masses. If you're one of the masses, you're a mental midget. So, on with okay, plot. so on with the plot. Um, so we get to the point, there's a new assignment, there's a woman who's owning books that she's not supposed to own, being any book. So owning a book? She owns a book, therefore she needs to not have those books. That was really weak. <laughs> um, so, so apparently, so they get there, the firemen get there, the woman is there when she's not supposed to be. So apparently the police are supposed to come and remove the suspect that owns said book so that we can just be... So I did that... it. I burned the house down. <laughs> so that it the was books me. in the house can be destroyed... Without the suspect getting... Without there. any interaction between the firemen... Right. ...and the suspect. As they're going into the house, this is... I, I couldn't get over how this happened. They're going up the stairs... And books are just flying, ev flying just everywhere. Books fucking everywhere. And one just falls into Guy's hands. Oh, I didn't do it. It just it just fell into my hands. I didn't pick up this book. <laughs> they, they douse everything with kerosene. They're ready to go. And the woman will not budge. She won't leave. She's, you're going to burn me with these books. I want nothing to do with any of what's outside of this house. Which I kind of like to think that's how we would be. Oh yeah, I'd be fucking, just just do it. <laughs> just do it. Just fucking, just, just, I mean like. Bet you you won't. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I joke about killing myself way too often, but like, don't, don't take my books and, away, that's all I got. <laughs> and also, this is like the first time we really see a lot of emotion and almost like humanity from Guy. Yeah, a little bit. Like, yeah, cause All the other guys are like, yep, okay, just, let's burn this. Just fucking leave her. She doesn't want to go. Let's go. And he's like, I want to get home and watch my shows. We can't We can't leave this poor we woman here. We can't just burn the house down with her in it. And, they don't, and nobody else gives a shit. And Captain B gives the order to let it rip, and they burn the house down. Interestingly enough, though, this is the first time that we see that Captain B might know more than he lets on. We do get a little bit out of him, but we're, again, we're going to talk later. about that later. Guy ends up taking this book that just fell into his hands. He takes it home, and he puts it under his pillow. And then he and his wife get into another argument about, you don't love me, I don't even know you anymore. And Mildred has no clue exactly how emotional the conversation is. 
She she's just so completely clueless. She's she, so checked out of reality. This is all right. This is the part of the book like re- actually genuinely got to me. He goes, "Mildred, do you remember how long ago we met? Do you remember where we met?" And she goes, "Well, no, but why is it important?" Their entire Mildred. relationship isn't important to her. Mildred, come on. Like, okay, I don't care what kind of relationship situation you are in. If you have one partner, if you have multiple partners, regardless of the gender or the sexual orientation of said partner, that is so knowing and remembering and cherishing the first time you met your partner is so important. And this, this guy, this poor guy, lives in a world in which no one, we would assume, not just his wife, but no one values that kind of sentimentality. I would also like to point out, I can remember where I met my best friend from elementary school. We were both reading on the playground. I can remember where I met people I could not stand. I remember where I met my first boyfriend. Like, how do you forget your where you meet your husband mm-hmm. or how long you've known your husband mm-hmm. like that is a whole level of crazy that i'm not willing to delve into so some time passes guy finally brings up clarice to mildred mildred happens to know that the entire family up and left overnight because their daughter died in a car accident So Mildred checked into reality long enough to know this little tidbit of information. She left her little escapism reality. But everything else that happened prior to that wasn't important. (laughs) And honestly, Mildred is a plot device. Mildred is such a plot device. Mildred isn't a character. And honestly, I kind of want to know more about Mildred. I want a story about Mildred. (laughs) We're never going to get a story about Mildred, but again, we'll talk about that later. (laughs) So, after Guy finds out that uh, Clarice has died, quote-unquote, I, look, alright, I don't be, I don't mean to be all tin hattie, but, like, who knows if she's actually dead. She could have gotten, like, upped and picked up. I have so many conspiracy theories about that. She could have been killed by someone other than a car accident. It could have been anything. But the point is, Again, like And we'll get to reasons why we think these she isn't actually dead. Clarice is Clarice is also less of a character and more of a plot device because as soon as her worth in Guy's story is up, she's gone. (laughs) Yep. And maybe I mean maybe the fact that maybe getting her out of the picture was also a plot device in itself. But Definitely. But it's you still kind of feel like once she's once she's not important anymore, we just kinda killed her off and you know. She's done. After he finds out about this, Guy is, like, sick. He gets physically ill. He gets a fever. He says, I don't want to go to work. But you know that there's a lot of other things going on. Like, we know that he's currently holding contraband in the form of a book within his house. There's a lot going on there. It's not just, oh, I'm sick. I don't want to go to work. And, oh, my God. This part... He, he basically spills his guts to Mildred about everything that he's, that's been going on. And I never wanted to be a fireman. I just felt like I had to be a fireman because my dad was a fireman and my grandfather was a fireman. And it felt like the right thing to do at the time. And he's just like, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't think it's fair. And Mildred's just like, hmm. Sucks to suck. Yeah, yeah. Sucks to be you. Go to work. I want my TV. He's not coming to work. Captain B shows up at his house and talks to him a little bit. And he tells him about the real history of firemen. Not the history that they tell everybody, but the real stuff. And this is where we learn Captain B is pretty damn smart. Captain B is pretty damn smart because he's in a position of power and they have allowed him to be smart. So he talks about how apparently since the 19th century, interest in reading and literature has just declined. And it started with shortening books from being long to being short, to turning it into a movie, to turning it into a little story in a newspaper, to turning it into that little bottom bar that scrolls along the bottom of the screen when you're watching news. So, so essentially, so essentially, what we're saying is, is anyone who uses Twitter, you are what Ray Bradbury hated in society. Oh no, <laughs> no, what he hated more than the people who use Twitter are the people who use vines. 
<laughs> You're putting all this information into six seconds, god damn you! <laughs> he would have hated Vine. Oh my god, he probably, I mean, when did, I, did he? He do? passed away in 2012. I want to say that Vine, like, started in 2012. But it wasn't big, I don't think. No, it was it wasn't, it didn't hit, like, the way that it did, like, it in the past hit, year or two. Yeah. And damn, when we go back and listen to these years later, we're gonna be like, wow, remember Vine? So, so essentially what this ended up being, what Captain B tells to Guy is, we started doing this as a society because people couldn't take opinions. They couldn't take intellectuals. They didn't like the fact that they had to spend all of their time reading these long-form books to get a piece of information across. The quote that he uses exactly is, intellectual became the swear word that it deserved to be. I want to say now, because I did a little bit of background research on Ray Bradbury, he hated the entire concept of an intellectual, which is weird considering where this book ends up going. Mr. Bradbury was a person of contradictions. He really was, though. And he talks about how, like, you know, books are dangerous because they have conflicting opinions, and no matter where you were in society, there was always going to be something written that you didn't like. So, Beatty dumps all this information onto a poor, suffering Guy Fieri Montag, (laughs) <laughs> and he gives him an ultimatum. He's like, that book that you took from that poor lady's house, I'll let you keep it for 24 hours. You don't give it back to us and let us burn it, we're coming here. And we're burning you. And so he leaves, and he figure like, you figure, like, you know, he's actually gonna be the nice guy, you know? Like, guy's been working for me for a long time. I'll let him have this book for 24 hours. So he leaves, and... That's when Guy spills his deep, dark secret all over like, the floor. <laughs> Guy fucking snaps. Mildred's still there. Mildred has no idea. Mildred, the poor sheep, has no idea what's <laughs> going on. He runs to the foyer as soon as Captain B leaves, and he opens up the AC vent. He hasn't been storing one book there. He hasn't been storing two books. He's been storing, like, fucking 20. You want to know how to start a fire? That's how you start a fire. (laughs) You put 20 books in your air conditioning vent and not let any air come out of it. That thing is going to overheat. You're going to (laughs) die. Well, I got the impression that he had, like, laid them down flat and there was still airflow coming. It was just See, now, I don't know, but, like, I mean, how big is an air conditioning vent? Like, how many... (laughs) Try this at home, folks. Test this out for us. Open up your air conditioning vent and see how many copies of 1984 you can stuff into it. (laughs) So, so Mildred goes, like, all golden age Hollywood and starts, like, screaming at the top of her lungs. <laughs> You're going crazy, guy! And he's Whoa. just, and he's just, no, honey, come here. You're going to sit down with me. We're going to read these books. And when 24 hours are up, we're going to bring them to Captain Beauty. We're going to let him burn him. But we need to read these now. Sit down, honey. Stop screaming. Don't you dare call the police. Sit down. We're going to read these books together. And this is, this is, oh my god. This absolutely wrecked me when and, I read it. And she also, like, kind of snaps. Like, she's like, I don't even know you anymore! When he was, like, 20 minutes ago, he's like, Honey, where were, where did we first meet, honey? Oh, I don't know, does it even matter? And now she's pulling the whole, like, I don't even know you anymore. Um, But this is, this is, like, this was actually kind of heartbreaking for me. He opens up the book and he starts reading. He doesn't know how to read at all. Like, they can read basic things. But he's he's stumbling, and he's super self-conscious about it, and it, like, honestly, it was kind of, it was kind of saddening. Basically, what I got from it was, he's at, like, Dr. Seuss level. <laughs> he's at Dr. Seuss level reading. Was... And this is, like, reading The Grapes of Wrath. I was, I was at Dr. Seuss level when I was two. But I'm special, so... I was too <laughs> I'm a special snowflake. I was at Dr. Seuss level at, like, two. So that's the end of part one. In part two, he spent the entire afternoon just trying to read these books. And he's, you know, he's just kind of, like, sitting in a corner, like, minding his own business. But guess what? It's the fucking hound at his door. Out of fucking nowhere. Someone has sent the evil robot water bear to hunt him down. <laughs> Spider dog. He figures, he figures, oh, I'm safe, you know, I'm in my house. And eventually, the hound goes away. And But he's still kind of acting, like, he's going all conspiracy on his way. He's like, oh my god, 
who sent the they're going to find us? Mildred's kind of going all conspiracy about the why the fuck is the robot dog here, but Guy, on the other hand, is going all conspiracy about, like, you 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 trying to kill yourself and Clarice dying and the woman who died in the house, they're all connected somehow. And I don't know how, but I want to be the one to figure it out. He's thinking back to this, like, we actually get, like, a fla- like a proper flashback yeah. for like a, from, like, a year ago. He's been holding these books in his house for a year. Because a year ago, in a park, he ran into this old man. We find out that he was an English professor uh, until the liberal arts college he worked at closed 40 years ago. And so basically all higher education 40, right. stopped 40 years ago. Guy comes up to him and Guy's got his like fireman's uniform. Oh, yeah. And, he, and of course this old man automatically thinks, this guy's here for me. I'm in fucking trouble now. Because he, he's got a guilty conscience. But he's basically. an but he's an old man. He kind of figures, you know, if this is my time, it's just gonna fucking come. He gives him his address and says, "If you want to arrest me, this is where you're gonna find me." <laughs> like this guy has, is no fucks given. And so guy's been guy's been checking out. Yeah, he he gives him he gives him his phone number as like it's like I'm turning myself in. Just fucking take this. If you decide that I'm like a menace to society, call me up and tell me so I can like I don't know come in prepare myself. I don't know so, so I can know not to fight the police when they come. I don't know <laughs> like what can you, can you read me my rights over the phone? That would be great. Here I'll bring the books to the fire station myself. So he calls up this number because the book that he has from the lady's house, he thinks that it's the last copy of the Bible ever. He's convinced, like, that's what he has in his hands right now, is, like, the very last copy of the Bible. Because, I mean, like, he has no idea what's going on in his situation right now. He has no idea how many copies of each book is around. No one does. Everyone's got to assume that their copy is the last copy because there are no book clubs that you can go so, and say, so who else has So this, this man, uh, Professor Faber, I want to say it was Faber, because Faber sounds really, really weird. He, he tells him how to get to his house, and Guy leaves the house. With um, the book. And before he leaves... He turns to Mildred and they have a little bit of dialogue and he delivers this fucking savage line. Does your fake TV family love you? <laughs> savage. Fucking wrecked. D- does the parlor aunt love you? Mm-hmm. Fuck it. I don't give a damn anymore. I think, yeah, honestly, I think at this point he's convinced, like, you know, there is no love between us. Whatever love that we've had for the past, like, ten years or whatever is just gone. You're not the same person that I knew when we first met, wherever the fuck that was. <laughs> or, I'm not the same person. Mmm, that's deep. Because, you know what, I get the feeling that Mildred has always been this way. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, you know what, I can see, because they don't, we don't really get into that I in the book at like all. I feel like Mildred has always been this girl who accepted what society was. Went to high school, got married right out of high school to Guy. Maybe. And, and I mean, I mean, Guy wasn't any different until, like, what? Like, how, over the course of, like, two weeks this book happens? Two weeks ago, he was exactly the same. Like, he was he deriving was he was deriving sexual pleasure out of the burning of books. Come on. <laughs> He's changed in the past two weeks. Let's go with a month. Let's, let's be conservative. All right. Because two weeks went on between him meeting Clarice and her disappearing. Yeah, so let's say, like, yeah, let's say, like, three weeks to a month this has been going on. So he leaves, and he tries to, he he takes the subway to get to Professor Faber's house. And, look, I don't know if you've ever tried to do anything of any importance when you are riding public transit. It fucking sucks. Even without, like, in the book, he's got these fucking advertisements playing over the sound system the entire time as he's sitting there trying to, like, read and memorize little lines of the book. It's the worst goddamn thing. He's trying to, like, he, they describe it as being, like, a sieve filled with sand. As much as he's trying to absorb the things that are going into his brain, most of it just keeps falling out. And then he's got, he's bombarded by the noise on the train and the ads going, and he like, just can't hold it like, all. Like, can you imagine trying to just grab sand? And when you grab sand, the harder you try to hold on to it, the faster it slips away from you. And the more pissed off you get. By the time Guy gets off the fucking subway, he is enraged. <laughs> 
He is probably about ready to kill someone. Oh yeah, and he and he's like screaming, and everybody's like paying attention to him. And he is not being very discreet going to this book meeting, basically. Yeah. This illegal book he's meeting. Not, he's not being discreet at all. He goes to Professor Faber's house, and he shows him his book, and he talks about books with Faber, and Faber kind of talks about... This actually was, was something that was really important to me, and it's something that I kind of want to talk about a little bit later, which is... Um, I Faber, feel like that's <laughs> gonna be our byline. We'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that later. I'm gonna put that. That's gonna be our um our Twitter headline, like underneath our banner. <laughs> Burn while reading. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> Faber Faber makes this actually really good point about how like it's not the book itself that embodies all of these like important things. Like as much we and and actually that's something that they go over later is like. The book itself is not what holds the information. It's about making sure that what you're consuming has depth. It allows you to make your own opinions about whatever it is you're consuming. It allows you to have disagreements with whatever you're consuming. And it allows you to choose how you act based on what you are consuming. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be from a book. As long as you're being allowed to make an opinion about the things that you're reading, that you're watching, that you're listening to, that you're listening to, that you're playing. Fucking video games can have good points. I've seen it. I've played them. It's not about the type of media that you're consuming. It's just making sure that it's the things what you that get out of it. It's what you get out of it. Like we're capable of thinking and it doesn't matter what type of media we are thinking about as long as we're thinking at all. And being critical of it. At this point in the book when I was reading, this is what I got out of it. But it, that changed just a tiny bit as we got on. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Faber at this point is like, everybody who would have cared about books and the burning of said books are too old to do anything about it. So we're just trying to like... Keep hold we're just trying to keep it alive hold on to it fly under the radar make sure we don't get arrested or burnt up but montag is like montag wants action montag wants to dismantle the system from the inside honestly i picture his personality being like alexander hamilton's from hamilton <laughs> he's like <laughs> i want to fuck it i'm gonna take these books and i'm going to hide a book in every single one of the firemen's houses among the city so they take each other down and it's gonna be great he like i'm going to, to destroy it from the inside he wants people to suffer he wants revolution in the streets guy fieri wants to watch <laughs> the world burn you mean Montag? That's, no, I meant Guy Fieri. He probably <laughs> wants to watch the world burn, too. And and so he's, like, really, really vehement about this. So Faber eventually, he, he gives in, and he's like, all right, you know what, I'll help you out with this. I've been designing a fucking wire that looks like the seashell radios that are used everywhere in this world. I want to say, when I was reading about the seashell radios at the beginning of this book, I was a little bit worried. Because isn't Apple, like, making cordless headphones? right now yeah we are one we are one step away from those cordless headphones becoming tiny radios that you can just put in your ear and not see they look like earplugs you just like little little tiny radios you can't even tell the difference so fair has been designing a wire that looks exactly like one of those radios and so how this is going to work is faber's like i'm gonna have a microphone here you're gonna stick one of these things in your ear and i'm going to talk to you and tell you what to do this and I will event. be able to hear you, and you'll be able to hear me. And so, so a guy goes along with it, and he sticks one of the, one of the thingies in, and he just goes home, and he wanders around, and and now Faber is allowed to kind of like feed him instructions based on the things that Faber hears, and what Montag's doing. So he goes home, and Mildred's not alone anymore. Mildred decided to invite friends over. She's decided, let's throw a party! Let's throw a goddamn party with two of the, the local mothers in the neighborhood. And this just lowered my respect for these people even more. Oh my god, these the mothers are god-awful people. They're talking about their husbands, and they're talking about their kids, and they're they talking about... No, they really... They, 
They yeah. outright say. One says that she's never going to have kids, which is totally understandable. I don't way. really want kids. No. She's talking about her kids and, oh well, no, she's talking about the fact that she never wants to have kids, but her husband's been sent away to fight in this kind of very vaguely mentioned war at the time. But he'll be back within 48 hours. It's going to be a quick war. It's going to be a qu- within uh, fucking 48 hours. That is what war has been reduced to at this point. Or what what they think, think war has been reduced to at this point. The other lady's talking about how, oh, I never even see my kids. I sent them away to a boarding school. They come home on weekends and holidays, and I stick them in front of the TV, and I don't even have to deal with them. Guy actually, like, brings up, like, don't you think you should be a little, have a little bit more concern for the loved ones in your life? They treat it as, oh, he's getting political. Let's talk about politics so we can make Guy happy. I don't like this guy because he looks funny, and I think he was picking his nose, and he's uh, obviously the worst choice compared to this other. I don't even think this, this guy is, looks so handsome and charismatic. He's clearly the right choice. I I know personally family members who did vote and have voted based on those things, and it's fucking awful. It's terrifying. But this is the thing that I want to bring up is. Uh, we know how the people feel about the politicians. Are the politicians actually, like, are like are the people that are being voted in as president in this universe actual political figures, or are they just media figureheads? I, I, what, I, like, if the government is responsible for all these god-awful things that are going on, is it the same politicians that we're seeing on television? That, uh, I'm getting into... We're getting into conspiracy theory land. It's the Illuminati. It's always the Illuminati. Trust me. (laughs) So these ladies get on Guy's nerves so badly that he almost literally throws a book of fucking poetry (laughs) at them. Read a goddamn book! (laughs) He just... He basically forces them to listen to him read this poem. Like, he, like, locks down the house. No one's leaving. You're gonna fucking sit here and listen to me read this beautiful poem, and you're gonna fucking like it. And one of the ladies starts crying as he's reading it. Like, her brain can't comprehend how beautiful it is. And she just starts bawling. And the other lady gets really pissed off, and they both leave eventually. After he finishes the and poem. He gets to finish the poem. And and Mildred is miserable and so pissed at him. So she, of course, uses her usual bailout. She takes some sleeping pills and just fucks off. <laughs> <laughs> and and Guy just decides to leave. He ends up at the fire station, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He decides to go back to work. He's like, you know what? Fuck all this. Nothing's going right. I'm just going to go to work and get started on my plan. All the while he, that he's doing this screaming and shouting and reading poetry. Faber is listening to all of this. And he's like, this what, the is fuck? A- what the fuck are you doing? This is part of the plan. It. Don't do this. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing, Guy? Basically, Guy has a me- another mental breakdown right there. And Oh, yeah. Guy, so Guy goes back to the firehouse to actually get on with the plan. The actual plan now. And he gets to the firehouse. And guess what's fucking missing? The fucking dog is gone. Spider dog is nowhere to be seen. And he's kind of happy about this. He goes to sit down and play cards like he always does with his coworkers. And Captain B starts fucking poking him by quoting all of these Without rhyme or reason, this is the thing that's really interesting about Captain B, because I don't know if he's actually as smart as we think he is. Or if he's just good at playing smart. He's very good at playing smart, whether he is or not. Because he starts quoting all of these, he starts quoting classic literature, he starts quoting philosophy, but he's doing it without any kind of rhyme or reason. He's basically bombarding Guy with word salad just to see how he'll react. Because he's not actually saying anything. When he puts all of those things together when he's talking about it, there's not a lot of, like... Substance. No, no. He's basically taking these big words to try and confuse Guy and get him to react. And eventually he does... Like, he starts really dicking with him. He really does. And and Guy's freaking the fuck out, like, sweating. He's a mess. Because all he can think is, Beatty knows about all the other books I have. So they get an assignment. 
and it's a special assignment. Apparently, it came in like an hour or so ago. And they get on the fucking fire truck and they drive. And guess what? It's fucking Guy's house. He's come to burn down his own fucking house. It's a mess and it's great. <laughs> And honestly, at this point, all I did was say, me. Why? <laughs> because that is how my life is going to go one of these days. I'm going to destroy myself. Someday, someday you're going to get an assignment and you're going to have to burn down your own fucking house. I'm going to just destroy myself. Like, let's face it. So we're on to part three. And of course, it fucking turns out that Captain B is the one that sent the robot dog after Guy. Should have been fucking obvious at this point, probably. It and still kind of surprised me, but I think that's more because it was my first time reading it. But here's the thing, and I want I want to see if you caught on to this as, uh, at the same time that I did. Is did you kind of get like a vibe that Captain Beatty might have been responsible for Clarice's death when he kind of talks about like, oh, maybe that Clarice girl was better off dead. It's better that she was hit by a car. Like, yeah, it seems be- just a little bit shady. And that's how we actually know about all the watch lists. Oh, you know what? Yeah. Guy talks to Beatty about this and... Hang on, I'm trying to remember this now because I don't remember this part. All the strange people are put on a list and they're watched by the government. Oh my god, that's true. Jesus. So Mildred, (laughs) Mildred drives away. Without a fucking word. She Mildred's just, like, fuck this shit, she I'm out. She doesn't say goodbye. She doesn't say a word. She gets up, she drives. She's crying about, like, the loss of her televisions. Oh, the poor house is going to be burned down. But not a fucking word to Guy. Guy is dead to her. Yep. It's, it's, it's kind of brutal, actually. But, you know, after... All the shit he put her through in the last twenty four hours. You know, yeah, maybe maybe it's fair. But it turns <laughs> out it turns out that Mildred is the one that fucking snitched. No, no, I didn't. No, but, was well, it Mildred okay. or was it's, it one of her friends? It's it's both. Apparently, okay. her friend snitched first, and then once Guy bailed, Mildred snitched also. Yeah, once after Guy left the house, she called it in too. So so we basically had two people fucking snitch on Guy. So they know they got confirmed. This fireman has books in his house that he is not supposed to have. He has not burned He's them. He's had yet. them for forever, basically. Mm-hmm. So oh my god. So Beatty Beatty doesn't want to make this easy for Guy one bit. He hands him a fucking flamethrower and says, You're going in there, you're gonna burn this shit on your own. And when you come out, you're under arrest. What kind of sadistic fucking... Uh, yeah. Uh, Beatty, I beat his... This is like a new low that I have seen. Mm-hmm. Where this is just pure mental torture. Honestly, what I think Beatty was going for was for Guy to walk into that house, set everything afire, and not walk out. You think so? You think that he he was going to play guy so much that guy was just going to go I, nuts and kill himself? I think that's what the whole purpose was because what is there for guy after he gets arrested? That's true. I mean, he's got he's got no job. He's got no wife. He's nothing. got nothing. He had his books and now he's got to burn his books. Meanwhile, meanwhile, he's still got Faber's wire in his ear. Faber's trying to fucking get him to run, like really trying. Faber's like, get the fuck out. The hound shows up, and that's when Guy pieces it together that Beatty sent the hound after him. He thought it was, like, another fireman, that someone was out to get him because he was too good at his job or something. Guy's kind of an idiot. Yeah, Guy's a little bit of a mess. <laughs> Poor Guy. So, so Guy is too afraid of the hound, wherever the hound may be at this moment in time, to be willing to run because he knows that hound's gonna fucking hunt him down so guy goes kind of nuts and like doesn't just aim at the books he like he, he he actively decides to burn furniture he he burns his own fucking bed and a bunch of the other furniture because he's basically like mildred fuck you fuck you for everything we've been through so he leaves the house and he's burnt everything he's burnt everything down Beatty knows he has the wire and he takes the wire out, and he fucking crushes it. 
And so BD knew about the wire the whole fucking time. BD has been playing him since the fucking beginning, and he is an insult to Guy's entire humanity, and Guy fucking loses it. For the third time. But but the big this is the big one. He probably <laughs> he could have walked away. He fucking loses it after this one. He takes the flamethrower and he roasts Beauty to a crisp. This boy is down. He is never getting back up. And Guy has reached a new low in his life where he doesn't give a fuck about anything. But guess what? Here comes the fucking dog. The second Beauty's burned to the crisp, the fucking hound shows up. But guess what he does? He burns the fucking hound to the crisp too. It's great. He's just like, you know what? They gave me this weapon. I'm gonna fucking use it. And it's and it, and it would have been even better if the hound doesn't actually get him in the leg with the trank needle before it burns to a crisp. So he's <laughs> gotta run with a bum leg away from cops, away from helicopters. And he's, keep in mind, these cars drive at like a hundred minimum. No one has any regard for speed limits in this world. So he's got next to no chance of escaping. He, as, as he's running, he's kind of thinking about, like, his books, and he's thinking about, oh, that's right, I fucking forgot. He So he goes to the hedge in his garden before the police start chasing him, and he finds several of his books. Because Mildred, he had hid some of them. Mildred had some of the books inside the house, but he managed to hide four or five of them in a hedge. Mildred did not know about them. He grabs those fucking books, and he hops away on that bum leg like there's no tomorrow. And as he's running, he's thinking about how maybe Beatty wanted to die i i don't know if that's kind of like a i i don't see it i think that's him consoling himself that could be one of those like i need to try and justify this death he would not have if he had stopped fucking prodding me maybe i wouldn't have killed him but he kept poking me so he definitely wanted to die you poke that bear you know what's gonna happen you poke you poke this the is bear. just <laughs> rationalizing the horrific actions he has just taken and he gets to an alley downtown and he just fucking collapses and he also kind of recognizes where he is at this point true this this whole last the last couple scenes in the book were actually very much just kind of like whole like action thriller yeah like i'm just gonna run from the fucking cops because that's all i've got left you're low. <laughs> and he gets downtown and he finds a gas station he cleans up a little bit and he realizes, wait a second, the news is telling everybody, look for the running man. Not any description, just there is a man running. Look for the running man. The running man must be arrested. Well, if I don't fucking run... No one's gonna fucking know! They don't know it's me! So he stops running, and he thinks the police start chasing him, but it ends up just being a bunch of kids. In a like, car. Just joyriding. And then we get another flashback to Clarice. And how, what if those kids had been the ones to kill her? And it kind of goes on a tangent mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, a little bit. I actually, I, I actually kind of skipped a little bit of that tangent. Oh, just I because skipped that. We get it. You miss Clarice. Uh, we don't know what happened to Clarice. There's nothing that we can do about it. So he finds the house of a Mr. Black that he worked with. Mr. Black isn't home, but Mrs. Black is. And he sneaks into Mrs. Black's bedroom while she's in another room and he hides several of the books in her house. So he manages to complete the plan that he I mean it's a shit it's like it's a shit version of his plan, but he's managed to do it a little bit. He planted books in another fireman's house so that the rest of the fire station could just tear itself a fucking part. If he had books and this black guy had books. Mr. I don't say black. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Black. And Mr. Black had books. Who else has books? And B was quoting philosophy. Yep, you you basically say the fire station is full of dissenters. You fucking you, you, your government institution is shit. And he's been telling himself the entire time, I can't go back to Favor. He goes back to Favor's house anyway. I need to talk to him. I need to know what the next stage needs to be. And here's my favorite part of the book. Favor tells Montag that he needs to run to the countryside, follow the river follow some railroad tracks and eventually you are going to find a hobo camp filled with ivy league professors i want to be honest with you knowing exactly how much ivy league professors make do you really think they'd be able to survive out in the wilderness for more than a couple nights because i don't 
I don't know. I think some of them could. I maybe think some we, of them. Maybe some of them who weren't who weren't born and bred to be Ivy League professors. Yeah. Maybe maybe the couple that weren't trust fund kids. They aren't all professors. That's the thing. That's true. We find that out later. They're not all professors. Some of them are authors. Some of them were just uh, related to books in one way or another. Teachers, librarians, librarians students, poets. It's a little bit. It's later. a ragtag. <laughs> ragtag group. ragtag group of hobos. Faber tells him, you know, I I can't follow you right away, but I'll try and meet you up meet up with you in St. Louis. <laughs> There are going to be people in the Midwest who are going to be like, did you just say St. Louis? Try it again. <laughs> How do you say St. Louis? Uh, they really? pref- I believe they prefer St. Louis. I've always said St. Louis. A damn New England accent. You can't do anything <laughs> about it. This is a good time to point out, again, well, we did mention it very, very tiny. There's a war going on. And it's not a, oh, it's going to be done in 48 hours war. This is a big fucking war. We got... Fighter jets going up over the skies. It's a mess. This is going to be a big war, and no one knows it. But they keep sending people back, like, 48 hours later, because they need to maintain this illusion that everything is fine. While Guy is at Faber's house, they've got the TV on, and apparently there's another fucking robot dog. They got a dog from a different district. To come and hunt down Montag. So Faber's like, all right, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take your clothes off. You're going to get a set of clothes from my thing. You need to burn everything you've ever touched that you have on you. And you're going to run until the trail runs cold. The dog is not going to be able to catch your scent because it's going to smell me instead. So Guy does that. He but fails again. the problem is, is that the dog is going to track him to Faber's house. That's true. So we don't actually know what happens to Faber by the end of this. Like, we, we we can hope, we can assume that he managed to get away, but we don't really know because, yeah, the, the dog's trying to hunt him and, and chase him down to Faber's house. So Guy bails. He manages to make it out of town. He reaches the river just in time. He changes into Faber's clothes that he's carried. He washes his scent away, and then he just floats on down the river. He kind of is like, you know what? This is nice. And this is this is the first time that he actually notices all of those things that Clarice was talking about at the beginning of the He book. actually takes time to appreciate nature. And honestly, I think this next part is the most unrealistic part. Is it the part with the funky dreams or There's a little there's a little scene where he's floating on down the river and he has these really funky dreams. Like one of them is about him finding a like it's kind of like this really almost ro- like romantic kind of thing where like he finds a barn and he he goes to sleep up in the hayloft, and in the morning he finds a, a glass of freshly squeezed milk and an apple for him. And then he has another fucking dream where the hound catches up to him, and he fucking wakes oh, up. Oh, I the, remember He that wakes one. up on the fucking riverside and freaks the fuck out. But in the morning he goes to a forest, he walks to the railroad tracks, and he fucking finds the hobo camp. Yay! And the Hobo Camp isn't anti-TV, surprisingly enough. They have a little tiny battery-powered TV that they use just to, like, keep track of, of current events and stuff. But I don't know if they're an- not anti-TV or not anti-let's-know-what-everyone-thinks is going on. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Later. Um, so, so, yeah, so all of, basically all of these hobos used to be Ivy League professors or Very authors. educated people. As hobos, <laughs> the like, educated hobo. That's a that's a good uh, like. Just picture it. It's a good any image. teacher you had, a the, college professor, anyone. The prettiest tenth grade English teacher in the whole wide world is now a hobo living in the middle of the forest. I kind of like it. <laughs> who has memorized these books, and that is their only value is the fact that they have these books memorized. Oh yeah, so this is the whole. This is the way that the camp works. Is they they actually like refer to themselves by name as like the books that they've they memorized. They refer to themselves by title, and they become the book. What they do is they they memorize it, and then once they feel like they've memorized it sufficiently, they get rid of the hard copy, and they exist as. Like the a, only copy of the book. Like a vocal recording of that entire book. So that once this regime apparently has passed. Or whatever whatever you would call it. Once once people come to their senses. 
they can republish all of these books. Write the, write the book down and republish it. Montag becomes part of this uh, this camp of Ivy League hobos. And I can't remember what book he was. Oh, um, it's the, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a part of the Bible. It's not, he doesn't actually have the last copy of the Bible ever, but it's a part of the Bible. And the camp moves down river, and they're talking, and Guy has this bit where he kind of, like, remembers, like, well, he doesn't remember, but he can kind of, like, imagine where Mildred is right now and, like, wonders what she's doing. And just as they're getting away from, like, the very last outskirts of the city. The vestiges. Oh, yeah. Like, of the city. Like, you can see the entire city from where they're standing. It gets fucking bombed. One big bomb, entire city, just gone. And he knows that Mildred is in that city somewhere. So Mildred's dead? Faber's dead? All the firefighters are dead. Here's the thing, though. We don't know if Faber's dead. He could have gotten out in time. We just make the assumption that he's probably dead. I think it's safe to assume Faber is dead. And it drops. And right as the bomb is dropping, Guy remembers where he met Mildred for the first time. And that is fucking brutal. Gray Bradbury was like, you know what? You don't need your heart. Let me rip it out from your chest for you. And you don't, you're not attached to this character, this plot device, at all, the entire book. And then at the very fucking end, they're like, oh yeah, we met in Chicago. It's awful, and it's super bittersweet, and so the entire book ends with, like, this ragtag team of Harvard hobos <laughs> just wandering off to wherever the hell they can manage, gonna live off the land, away from the atomic wreckage, and then Montag finally starts to memorize the beginning of the Book of Ecclesiastes, and that's how it ends. You don't really grow attached to the book at all until that very last bit. Like, honestly... Until the very end of the book, I was like, why is this such a great book? As social commentary, I can see it as being really fabulous. So here's the thing, is that I I feel exactly the same way, and I do really like it as a work of social commentary. And I like it because you make the assumption it's written in 1953. Things were weird in 1953. McCarthyism was going on. People you had were, the Red Scare. Exactly. People were... That's, the same thing. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> let me have my moments, sorry. But it's the it's I mean, we have this this thing going on where the government is like putting people on watch lists for being strange, potentially communist, and people Doing people weird would just shit. Get, yeah, people would just get up and taken away and and deported from the United States out of nowhere. We did forget to come back to our reasons why we don't think Clarice is dead. All right. Oh yeah. So, okay. Let's back. Let's back it up. A let's little back bit. it up a little bit. Okay. Let's talk about so that. they were watching on the TV in the hobo camp. His chase. Oh yes, that's right. I forgot the mechanical hound because has accident it, it has not even a... accidentally it's not it's, it's the mechanical hound works on this amino acid signature but yeah. we know that guy is nowhere, nowhere in near. town right he now. he is literally watching this on the tv but one of the harvard hobos i like that name i'm gonna use it <laughs> the harvard hobos i get to say a good band <laughs> good band name just there. Uh, is watching this and he's like well the chase isn't gonna last much longer they're gonna catch you soon and guy is like internally freaking out because he thinks they're right behind him. This entire ragtag group is going to fall to pieces. He just destroyed everything. No. They're in the heart of the city. They don't want people getting bored. And they don't want people thinking there's a problem. So that so for good TV and for good TV alone, they pick out a guy completely at random who's on the street at the wrong time. And the hound wrecks his shit. And they Dead. make sure not to get close enough to where you can make out features. Nope, they don't show his face. They don't show his face. They don't show any distinguishing features. But in that moment, Guy basically died. His, but his identity has been destroyed. Now, to tie this into Clarice, and we're getting into some conspiracy theory I'm, level I'm, shit. I'm in, though, because I didn't even... <laughs> I didn't pick any of this shit up. Go ahead. I think that... Clarice knew too much. 
she was too different. Like, there's the I take walks at night and I like people watching level different. And then there's I'm an intellectual, quote, quote unquote. Quote, as much of an intellectual as a 17-year-old can be. Or as much of an intellectual as Ray Bradbury wants to put into one of his novels. Or. <laughs> and I don't even think she got hit by a car. I think someone told Mildred that Clarice was hit by a car because also let's take for the fact that Mildred came out of her little escapism fantasy long enough to know this and nothing else. Mm. And she if, was told. And if she wasn't told, even if she saw it on the news, like if this if this demonstrates that we can't trust anything, we can't on, trust any of their news. We can't trust anything in this. We world have an news. unreliable narrator in this novel. Unreliable narrator, unreliable characters, unreliable everything. Everything is unreliable. So I think Clarice is alive. And in an insane asylum somewhere. See, now, I wouldn't or, want to stretch the whole insane asylum thing. I think that they probably figured, there's a fucking war on. We should get the fuck out of here before anything awful happens. So if the news media managed to do this whole, like, yeah, there was a girl, she was hit by a car, her name was Clarice McClellan, it could have obviously, it could easily been a girl that happened to look like Clarice McClellan and the entire family just scarpered left town. See, but also what it could have been is that they harvest these people. Jeez! Like, I'm, I'm telling you it's some conspiracy This level is very, <laughs> I, like, I had my tin hat on with you until like two seconds ago. No, now no, I'm kinda... like, they gather these people and store them. Until a situation like guys comes up where the guy got away and then they release him into the streets to wander for the dog to hunt down Damn. for the purpose of good TV. Damn, that's who that's kind of that's very tin hatty and that's really dark and brutal. And you were the one that <laughs> fucking went there. And I was awesome. the one that went there. Oh, my God. OK. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I I think it's time to move on. All right, yeah, let's 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 wrap this up. Let's wrap this little 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 so, present up. Fahrenheit 451. Um, so well, impression. I impression. So my impression when I first when I when I, I mean first reread it. Haha. <laughs> um, when I was rereading this, like again, it was written in 1953. McCarthyism was going on. People were just people were being put on watch lists. They were being picked up and brought God knows where, put on trial for nothing, and deported from the country without so much as like we just assume that you were a communist because That's, you speak Russian. I, I don't know. I don't, uh, or um, I don't like your comedy. It's too political. So we're gonna fucking boot Deport you out of the you. country. Shit like that. It was it was 1953. You would assume that Bradbury got some kind of inspiration out of this because it's the vibes that you get. You you know while you're reading this book that the government has something to do with everything that's going on. Firemen is it? It's 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 a it's a government institution. You know, yep. like like the the municipality that the fire station belongs to is responsible for maintaining it. You can't say that the government is not involved in it at all. But here's the thing. This is the thing that really got me worked up. Apparently, in 2007, the LA Times ran an interview with Ray Bradbury. This was about five years before he died. And they talked about, you know, this this great work of, like, talking about government censorship and McCarthyism. And he said, oh, no, I never meant for it to be about that. It's not political. It's not supposed to be political. I just wanted to write a book about how people don't want to read literature anymore and how television is reducing our ability to read things critically. It literally, we had a great idea there and you, Ray Bradbury, ghost of Ray Bradbury, brought it down to the level of herder technology is scary. You brought it there. It could have been, like, you could have just... he blames so so we we mentioned this a couple times about how Ray Bradbury hates intellectuals. That does not coincide well with the idea that intellectuals, are Ivy, the League, thing- Ivy League professors, authors, poets are the ones that are going to keep society running. 
from this crazy dystopian future that you've made where everybody hates books. For the sole fact of that books are scary. If <laughs> there were <laughs> books are scary. Or te- or TV is scary now or books are scary then. You you had something there and then you had to go and say no, I never meant for it to be about that. It became it's he's the prime example of when an author says the sky is blue, it's not a fucking metaphor. He just means the sky is blue. It's a nice day out. It's a nice day out. That doesn't have anything to do with any deep-seated problems with his father. He just means it's a nice day out. God. It doesn't mean he finally fell in love. It's just sunny out. <laughs> That's really the point. He also, like, his, his whole point was, I cannot, he didn't blame the government for the things that were going on. He blamed people. Because at the same time, it was all people reporting each other. That's a true. A few of them are government pickups. That's true, but, but it was I, mostly but, people. But, but again, like you can't blame people for the revision of history that the firemen currently have true. on file. The only the government could have been responsible for that because only the government perpetuates those sort of things by existing. By existing and by and by working. I mean, maybe not working with the media, but. No, As, they're totally working with the media. Ah, uh, we're good. Uh, <laughs> topics I don't want to cover right now. <laughs> All right. Um, so for the sake of time, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Next time we'll be covering Romeo and Juliet. That, that or, we are. Our next- as I like to call it, the most extra teenagers ever. Oh, God. I'm going to so look forward to talking so about Romeo and Juliet. So looking forward to ripping that one apart. And if you've got any comments, questions, concerns, want to <laughs> talk more about Jen's crazy conspiracy theories about Fahrenheit 451, you can find us on Tumblr at Burnwall Reading. Mm-hmm. You can email us at burnwallreadingpodcast at gmail.com. And we are also on YouTube. We're actually going to be hosting our episodes on YouTube for a short amount of time until we get used to the format and we actually try to, like, branch out and look for other podcast streaming services or or, uh, hosting sites that we could possibly use. We're not ready to spend money on this just yet. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, we're we're still broke college grads. <laughs> so if you have any questions or comments, you can you can send it to any of those things. We'll, if you send us a message on Tumblr, we promise we will get back to you. We are waiting for your messages. So I believe this episode is airing sometime in April. I think is yes, what we it said. is. Yes, it is early April. So we will be back with Romeo and Juliet in May. Yes, we will at the beginning of May. So, I guess this is the end of the episode, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you next time. And until then, we will wait for you later, I guess. (laughs) That one fell flat. Keep reading, folks. Keep reading.